Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast, with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello there, dear listeners, Baha'i blogcasters. Thanks so much for joining us today. I am super duper thrilled to be talking to a Baha'i hero of mine, Dr. Michael Penn, who is Skyping in with me live from where are you in Pennsylvania? I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Lancaster. Franklin and Marshall College. Fantastic. And is yeah. that anywhere near Scranton? No, it's pretty far from Scranton, maybe an hour south of Scranton. Okay, okay. Because you know, I did a little TV show that was set in Scranton. Yes, that's right. We know. Yes. So we're um, the cast members in in that corner of Pennsylvania. <laughs> we're like gods. Oh, terrific! <laughs> <laughs> when I go to to Scranton, I'm literally like, I'm like worshipped and carried around on <laughs> on a litter <laughs> through downtown. It's pretty crazy, but it's beautiful there. I really love the uh, I love Pennsylvania, and those those hills are gorgeous. Wonderful. I love all the old stone buildings too. Yeah. What do you teach there? So I teach psychopathology, which is really the study of diseases, disorders, dysfunctions of the brain and nervous system that have an impact on consciousness. And so wow. disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar illness, depression, anxiety, these are the kinds of disorders that... So maybe we could just use this one-hour podcast as a therapy session for me. <laughs> maybe you can come up with some kind of diagnosis for what's wrong. What do you think? Uh, well, I think that you've got lots of good things going on. So I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> well, yes, we are all—we are very complicated human beings. We are complicated, aren't we? Indeed. I mean, we're come That's on. Right. We've got, we've got these brains and and these emotions and these chemicals coursing through us, and um, and then the the trauma of our childhoods that influence so many things influence our behavior. That's um, so what's um, what got you into this field of study? Well, when I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania, where I did my undergraduate studies, I actually attended a lecture. And it was a lecture given by the renowned psychologist Wade Nobles. And you could imagine that we were in a hall. There were about 400 people in the hall. And Wade Nobles gave a talk that was so powerful that when he finished, everyone remained silent for about two or three minutes. No one clapped. No one moved. And uh, I said, whatever this man does, that's what I want to do. And I found out that he was a clinical psychologist, and so I decided that I was going to pursue that. Although I had not much of an idea of what clinical psychologists do, I mm -hmm. just knew that I wanted to be associated with uh, with some of the ideas that he'd been sharing with us. Now, does a clinical psychologist sometimes see patients as a counselor? Yes, yes. So clinical psychologists are trained in what's called the Boulder model. So we are research practitioners. We, we undertake research and then we try to see clinical cases that apply to the kind of work that we do, that, that relate to the, the questions that we're asking in the laboratory. Oh, I see. So you're on, uh, in, a, in some ways on a course of study and then you do see patients that relate to that course of study that's exactly right. Yes. Right. So what, what what we try to do is we try to generate theories that are testable both in the laboratory and with clinical populations. That's that's really cool. And um, how how did you become a Baha'i? Where does your Baha'i uh, journey fit in with this incredible mm. professional journey of yours? Mm. Mm. So when I was an undergraduate, um, I became. Um, what might be described as a seeker following a near-death experience. Wow. Um, I was uh, in my bed one night around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and I had the very definite feeling that, uh, that I was dying. And I'm not speaking here metaphorically. I wasn't dreaming. Uh, it was just a very profound experience, a profound encounter with my own mortality. And when I saw myself in that state, it was very clear to me that I wasn't the kind of person that was ready for death. Mm. Uh, I, I felt like I had essentially wasted my life. I was around 22 years old. 
And uh, I felt that uh, I hadn't accomplished anything. I hadn't been concerned about anything that really mattered. And so this threw me into a, a state of intense despair and an intense worry. And in that state, I started to actually read uh, the works of the great um, philosophers. Mm. And, uh, and uh, among the very first philosophers that I read were the prophets of Israel. I was serving as a janitor in a um, school that taught Hebrew and Judaic studies. And so every night I would go to the library and I would read in the library the prophets of Israel. And there was something about the discourse of these prophets that really moved me. And so this sort of set me on a journey where I began to study intensely the writings of the founders of the world's great religions. And, and what, did you remember, learn, what did you learn from the prophets of Israel? I, there were two things that, on this journey. I'm not sure that I learned anything. It was more a, a very, very powerful attractor. Mm -hmm. I found that, that their mode of discourse, the kinds of questions that they were asking, mm -hmm. the way that they asked these questions, there was a kind of a rhetorical quality that I hadn't encountered in the reading of other philosophers. And so I thought that there was perhaps something to the life of these great thinkers that I needed to know more about. They go right to the core, don't they? They get they, right to the center of like, why are we here? What does God want from us? What do we do? Exactly right. And they do it in a way that um, is uh, compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, they do it in a way that's very, very difficult uh, to... Uh, to turn away from. And so I found myself consuming more and more of the literature of the Jewish prophets. Uh, and then, of course, this turned me on also to uh, uh, the writings of the Buddha, which I began to study intensely. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to the church that uh, Martin Luther King had given the first sermon in. It was mm -hmm. a church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the minister of that church uh, moved me to my very core. And so, in a sense, I became thirsty for more and more knowledge of the world's religions. And it was really in that context that, uh, that I became a seeker after spiritual truths. And that led me to the study of Islam uh, when I transferred to the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I studied with a great um, Kierkegaard philosopher whose name was Stephen R. Dunning. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to Stephen Dunning, a professor whom I love, uh, and I said to him one day, uh, Professor Dunning, I have now studied for a couple of years the writings of these great masters of religion, and I hear in all of them the same essential voice, the same essential call. And he said to me that I had read these um, thinkers too superficially. And, uh, of course, that just intensified my... Ah, <laughs> that's a challenge. My, my crisis. Gauntlet thrown. That's right. That's I have a funny right. Kierkegaard story. My wife um, visited Kierkegaard's house in uh, Copenhagen or somewhere in Denmark and um, saw his ring was in, um, that he always wore was in this cabinet. And oh. she took pictures of it and she just fell in love with it, the design of this ring. So she made a, she fashioned a new wedding ring. She took off oh. our old wedding ring. I don't know why. And she's got a new wedding ring that's She's got an exact copy of Kierkegaard's ring as oh. our wedding ring. Wow. Do you have it on? No, she has it. She wears it. Oh, she it. has it. Okay. I'll show you after the interview. I'll show you. I'll get <laughs> it for perfect. you. It's, I'd love to it's, see it's, it. It's really beautiful. Yeah. So that can, so that's, so you were, and it's funny that you bring this up because this was originally when we were starting Soul Pancake, this was the kind of discussion that we had is that, you know, if we want to let people know about the Baha'i faith, they first need to have a deep curiosity about the world. They need to be digging into questions of, of philosophy and spirituality and even psychology to try and understand themselves and the world and their place in it better. You, you need to have a seeker before you can impart the information. And that led us to discussions about uh, individual investigation of truth and, and the importance of just making that journey okay for young people, a journey of self-discovery, a journey into life's big questions and right. uh, philosophy. And that was the, the launching pad of the whole thing that became Soul Pancake. Sorry to plug my, my oh, brand, no. but um, 
it started in a, in a similar way. I love this story, and it's it's very similar to mine. And and so, how do you how do you go then from a, now a deep digging a deeper dive that this professor challenged you to do towards uh, the Baha'i writings? Right, right. So I was in the graduate lounge, reading one of these books at the University of Pennsylvania, and a fellow came over to me and said, um, given the kinds of material that you're reading, I think that you might be interested to meet some of the Baha'is who are graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania. And I said, well, um, sure. And he said, what about tonight? And so he invited me to a gathering called the Fireside. And Firesides are very informal meetings where somebody speaks about one of the principles that animate the Baha'i faith. And I can't remember the principle that was spoken about that evening, but I do remember that the atmosphere was unusually um, beautiful. Mm. Uh, sitting at the table, there was an African-American woman, there was a physician, there was a lawyer, there were several graduate and undergraduate students, uh, there was a mother with her children. And so it was a very unusual mixture of people. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the unusual quality of the gathering, given the diversity of it, that really attracted me. It's funny that you bring up the diversity of the meeting and the spirit of the meeting. And we talk about diversity sometimes so theoretically, like, oh, diversity is important and unity and diversity. Um, but it has a power, doesn't it? It has an incredible power. I know my wife, when she became a Baha'i through doing the Ruhi books, uh, mm -hmm. we did Ruhi 1 and 2. And it really was the incredible diversity of our group that was so attracted to her. The, the combination of that diversity and the Baha'i writings. But yeah. we had these this older African-American pair of twin sisters that were yeah. staunch Republicans. Uh, yeah. And uh, our facilitator was from Namibia. And there yeah. was a, philosoph a graduate philosophy student and yeah. housewife and yeah. uh, recent Persian uh, refugees. Yeah. And it was just so deliciously diverse that it was this human family that came together every week and studied the writings. And that yeah. really magnetized her. Yeah, you know, that Abdu'l-Bahá, who had come to the United States. He was the eldest son of Baha'u'llah. In describing the Baha'i faith, he once said, uh, it is the end to foreignness. Mm. It is the being at one in complete dignity and freedom with all that dwell on earth. And certainly when one enters Baha'i gatherings, one gets the sense uh, of, of, of this, this promise being fulfilled, that mm. we would find a way into one another's hearts. Uh, that uh, that that overcame um, alienation and estrangement. Um, that that's is often the yeah. You know. Yeah, that's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. So, uh, what happened then? You're off and running, in the Baha'i faith. No, no, no. I, uh, you know, I attended that gathering and I just started to read for a year, uh, pretty intensely. And then I went to a place called Greenacre. Greenacre mm -hmm. is a is a uh, conference center that for more than a hundred years has invited people of various faiths to reflect together on um, the destiny of humanity, uh, on the core spiritual principles that could potentially unite us. And at Greenacre, uh, I uh, encountered what I would call the fragrances of the sacred. Uh, there was something about the place that, uh, that seemed to be diffusing um, sacred fragrances and the intensity of the love there was uh, was unusual. So I felt that I had been uh, attracted. That, that might have been my line yeah. of cologne, which is called sacred <laughs> fragrances. So I don't know, maybe some Baha'is were wearing it. Sorry for the lame joke in the midst of your beautifully profound no, talk. No, Sorry. Uh, okay, no, keep going. No, I'm uh, so I guess the point that I'm making is that. To become a Baha'i, it seems to me, involves two things. It involves, on the one hand, an encounter with uh, a body of, of writings that are, are beautiful and inspiring. And on the other hand, it involves an encounter with a community that uh, is a kind of a living proof that the ideas that are embodied in these writings are not just um, uh, meaningless sort of platitudes, mm -hmm. but, they, but, they, but they, they actually have an expression in the way that people relate to one another. They're backed and so, up by deeds, yeah. Exactly mm -hmm. right, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. And how then you became a Baha'i and 
How then did that intersect with your work? Uh, were there any light bulbs that went off? You're a clinical psychologist. Um, I'm not sure exactly what field of clinical psychology you were studying at the time, but did, um, did the two things intersect and explode in a great way, or did you kind of have a struggle like, hmm, how do I balance the spiritual with the uh, kind of moral, psychological, academic stuff that I'm pursuing? Mm. Well, I was studying at the University of Pennsylvania psychology, history, and religion. And so I was studying those three things at the same time. And uh, I've always been somewhat philosophical in my orientation to life. And so um, being philosophical wasn't the same thing as being, in, in my mind, religious or spiritual in any way. And so although I was very philosophical, I had the sense that I lived a kind of life that was uh, not you know, particularly um, deserving of respect or admiration. Uh, in fact, I had become a kind of person that if I had met myself, I don't think that I would have admired myself very much or respected myself very much. Hmm. And so philosophy was occupying one realm of my life, and then I was living a life that was not deeply philosophical. And so this disjuncture between hmm. a kind of a world of ideas and the kind of life that I was living, uh, I think, was the source of this, this, uh, this tension that I felt. And uh, when I became a Baha'i, I began to reconcile increasingly these two dimensions of my life, what I believed and the way that I behaved. You know um, what, I would, I would call that integrity, because uh -huh. when you think about the root word of integrity having to uh -huh. do with integration, and yeah. I think it's such a symptom of the Western world that yeah. what we believe or what we think right. we believe right. is very right. different than how we act yeah. and That's right. it's not put into practice. And yeah. I know this has been uh, for myself a, uh, a source of great consternation, you know, for the last decade or so, especially of, you know, how can I be the same person talking to you as I am uh, at a Baha'i gathering as I am at a press junket or uh, or just with friends that I'm in a fully integrated person where I don't present false selves in different places and my my belief system is is manifested in my actions wherever I go and absolutely it, it's a it's a it's a terrific struggle especially in a culture like ours don't you think yeah that's the great struggle my my wonderful teacher William Hatcher describes this as the challenge of moral authenticity. Mm. And he says that the, the chief challenge facing every human being is the, challenging, uh, the challenge of entering into right relationship with other living creatures. Mm. And uh, so he tries to describe what it might look like, what it might feel like, what it might be like to be in authentic relationship. And so I think that, that the longing for authenticity is really at, at the foundation of, 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 of human development. That sounds almost Buddhist, what you say, the, the right relationship with other living creatures. It's almost like the, the sevenfold paths or the four noble truths. Well, when, when we are in right relationship to other living beings, they come forth and we come forth. So we become what it is that we're capable of becoming. We become our, what the Buddhists would call our true selves. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is the idea also that animates the Baha'i faith, that everyone is in search of their true selves and that we have to create an environment in which it's possible for people to discover their true selves because we help people to feel safe enough to practice being their true selves. So what is our true self? Well, I think of the true self as embodying certain capacities. Uh, for example, the capacity to love, uh, which takes as its object beauty, the beauty of an idea, the beauty of a way of life, the beauty of nature, the beauty of oneself, the beauty of others. So the idea is that we have a natural attraction to beauty. Uh, beauty elevates us. Beauty inspires us. We want to say beautiful things. We want to do beautiful things. We want to be around beautiful people. And so this attraction to beauty is a part of our authentic identity. And so whenever we express vulgarity or whenever we are cruel or whenever we are unkind, this is a kind of a violation of our longing for beauty, beauty in ourselves and beauty in the world. And so we find these 
these um, uh, modes of inauthenticity disturbing. Mm. Uh, they disturb the atmosphere. They disturb our own spirits. Uh, they cause us to be disappointed in ourselves. And so part of authenticity has to do with um, pursuing uh, uh, beauty in our work, in our speech, in our way of life, in our manner of, of, of approaching others. Uh, there's a wonderful quotation that I'm just starting to learn. Uh, it says that, um, that uh, a kindly tongue is the lodestone of the hearts of men. Uh, it is the, the bread of the spirit. It clotheth the words with meaning. It is the fountain of the light of wisdom and understanding. And so when we hear people speaking in ways that are beautiful, in ways that are inspiring, uh, it enables us to feel safe to experiment w more with being our authentic self. So part of it has to do with our longing for connection to beauty. And this now, is you, also... Now, yes, please. Let, me, let me just back you up here a little bit because culturally speaking, beauty means Kardashians. And uh, what is, philosophically speaking or spiritually speaking, what is this beauty that you're referring to? I mean, I'm, obviously it's not... You're not referring to physical beauty, but um, what what is that? Is that uh, the qualities of God, the virtues of God made manifest? Is that mm. is that beauty? Is mm. is there an aesthetic quality to virtues? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, I I think about beauty as um, at once an attribute of a phenomenon and also a way of seeing. So beauty. Mm. So beauty is in the world, and beauty is in others, but I also have to have the eyes that are necessary in order to see beauty. And so beauty requires the development of my aesthetic sensibilities. So the more I refine my aesthetic sensibilities, the more capable I become of perceiving beauty. So beauty is, in a sense, a relationship between a perceiver and certain attributes in the world. And these attributes are traditionally associated with the attributes of God. And so when a human being manifests the attributes of God in their behavior, we call these virtues. But these attributes are apparent everywhere. They are apparent in everything that has life, uh, is a manifestation of, of, of the beauty of, of, of God, uh, according to Baha'i philosophy and the philosophy of, of many other traditions. So when Abdul Baha says, if a person has 10 bad qualities and one good one, focus on the good one, what you're essentially doing is you're focusing on the beauty of that person, which may be limited, but that's how you shift your, your eyes, as you say. Yes, and what that does to the person is that it enables them to see their own qualities. Mm -hmm. I mean, we call one another forth by the way we treat one another. And so if a t person treats me with dignity, and if a person sees in me qualities that are praiseworthy, I gradually begin to recognize that, uh, that I have these qualities, and I, I begin to long to develop them. And so, in a sense, by seeing the beauty in others, we cause the beauty in others to flower. Mm, that's gorgeous. That's just beautiful. The, um, you know, doing some work in, in Haiti and with underprivileged populations, um, this just the poorest of the poor, um, uh, seeing young girls in Haiti, seeing their individual beauty and their dignity and recognizing their dignity, respecting them, respecting Absolutely. their dignity, just allows them to flower in such uh, magnificent ways. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think, in fact, anybody who has interacted a great deal with the poor will recognize that the poor are the embodiment of so many beautiful qualities that mm. we need to learn from. Mm. And uh, I, I have been greatly enriched by my association uh, with, with the poor. And then this is one of the things that Baha'is are, are, are trying to learn more about, is how to be in a humble posture of learning in relating to, uh, to people at various um, um, conditions of life. Uh, because from everyone, uh, there there are lessons to be learned. Mm. It's 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 so true, uh, so true. There's so much more I could say about that, but I kind of want to get a little bit more into your story. Um, mm. There's so many things that you're studying. As I was investigating you, uh, I don't even really know where to start. But let's let's 
let's just start with where you're at right now. You're writing a book. You're on sabbatical from your college. Tell mm -hmm. us about what you're working on. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a book that tries to give a rational account of what might be meant by the human spirit. And the reason why I'm trying to give a rational account of what might be meant by the human spirit is that I believe that our abandonment of discourse on the human spirit is at the core of so many of the problems that we are having in our, uh, in our society. And, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to inspire a deeper reflection uh, on what the human spirit might be and what we might do in our own lives to cultivate its development, to cultivate its well-being. Um, so what, what does a dialogue on the human spirit look like? <laughs> yes, that's right. So part, part of the dialogue has to do with uh, providing a kind of description of the nature and needs of the human spirit that is at once um, rational enough to be attractive to people who uh, reflect deeply on things and at the same time accessible enough so that uh, it, it satisfies common sense. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying to write a book that uh, would be um, attractive to a very, very wide range of readers, of thinkers, uh, of people in different stations of life. I'm trying to address the human family, the human community hmm. in this particular book. Wow. And how's it going? <laughs> it's going very well. Good. <laughs> it's a book that I really, really love. I, I'm, I'm very eager to get it out. It's about two-thirds of the way uh, done, and, and so I, I hope that it will be finished at least in the first draft by, uh, by May. Oh, fantastic. So you've taken this year to do that work? I, that's right. I'm taking the, the, the last several months to, to focus on this, on this work. Do you, know, do you have a title yet? I do have a title, but I want to hold it. You want it. to go and keep it secret. Okay, good. If I may. Good, yeah, good. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Well, there's so many topics that you have written on, lectured on, studied. Um, hope is one of them. Uh, you've done stuff on race uh, and racism. You've done uh, studies on gender-based violence. So many right. different topics. Yeah. How did you choose these topics, and um, which of these do you want to address with us right now? Sure, yes. So my early training is in an area called experimental psychopathology. An experimental psychopathologist working in, in the laboratory, oftentimes using animals, try to create the conditions that mimic the development of diseases and disorders in human beings. So, for example, we might use rats or dogs um, in order to try to understand the conditions that lead to disorders in the functioning of human beings. And so, in my early work, I was interested in a phenomenon called learned helplessness. And in learned helplessness experiments, what happens is, for example, um, a dog might be exposed to an un uncontrollable aversive event like um, an electric shock from the ground or a loud obnoxious noise that the animal cannot turn off nor escape. Mm. And, so, and so when an animal is exposed to these conditions, um, it has a profound impact not only on the nervous system the, of the animal, but also on the animal's consciousness, on the animal's way of thinking about the world. And uh, so... Um, you're, talking, uh, you're talking about trauma, really. We're talking about trauma, exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And so this early work on trauma led me to begin to undertake clinical work with women and girls who had been exposed to various forms of trauma in the home, in the villages in which they lived, um, various forms of state-sponsored violence, for example, against women who were uh, held in detention as prisoners. And so I began to study the application of this laboratory work in the real world. And uh, this study of traumatized women uh, led to the, the first book that I wrote uh, on the epidemiology of gender-based violence. Um, and I wrote that book with a student of mine who went on to uh, complete her medical studies as a gynecologist. 
And that student, her name is Rahel Nardos. I'd just like to say a word about her. She was a remarkable human being. She, uh, she w came to Franklin and Marshall from Ethiopia, a small village in Ethiopia. And while she was at Franklin and Marshall studying with me, she decided that she wanted to send money home to the village that she had grown up in so that they would have plumbing, they would have bathrooms in her village. Wow. And so over the four years that she was at Franklin and Marshall, she sent money home. And by the time she graduated, uh, her village had plumbing throughout the village. And then she wow. went on to Yale Medical School completed her studies at Yale, and then as a gynecologist returned with a team of surgeons back to her village in order to provide surgery to women who had undergone female genital uh, mutilation oh my goodness. and were having difficulties having children or having painful uh, intercourse. And so she performed these surgeries for several months uh, as part of a surgical team. So I'm really, really, really proud of her. And uh, so my work is on the one hand in the laboratory, and on the other hand, I'm concerned with applying the kind of work that I do in real-world situations in the hope of improving the condition uh, of the peoples of the world. And speaking from a spiritual perspective, what do you hope to discover from this work, or what did you discover from this work that relates to uh, the teachings of Baha'u'llah? Mm. I discovered two things. The first is just how delicate the human spirit is, just how sensitive human beings are. And uh, because we have these sensitivities, we can create magnificent, beautiful things. But also because we have these sensitivities, we can be made ill relatively easily mm. by, by, by cruelty and inhumanity. Mm. And uh, so um, Baha'u'llah's teachings uh, seek to inspire in us the desire to treat others in ways that that respect them and that that honor their uh, delicate, delicate, beautiful spirits. And so we are on the one hand trying to uh, treat various illnesses, and on the other hand, we're trying to prevent them by uh, creating environments that are socially mature, uh, spiritually sound. Mm -hmm. Like that first fireside you went to. Like that first fireside, exactly right. Yeah, I, I'm reminded of that study. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to get it right, but I remember it in psychology class where the, the wire monkey study where monkeys were, that had, their moms had been taken away, and, but they created a wire mom with, right. some, with some fuzz on it or, or rug on it and the, how the baby monkey would just attach to that, right. uh, attach to the to the wire mom uh, right. in the cage, like we, we need that attachment so, so much. Yeah, you're talking about uh, the Harlow studies. The Harlow studies were the first laboratory-based studies that demonstrated the power of love in the development of mammals. You know, recently, um, researchers have begun to rethink even what mammals are. And uh, one of the things that has been discovered is that, of course, all mammals share a limbic system. And what limbic systems enable us to do is that it enable us to feel the feelings of other creatures. All mammals have the ability to sense the internal states of other mammals. That's why your dog, for example, can know if you're not feeling well, if you're depressed or if you're sick. And so this ability to feel in myself what another mammal is feeling is the very basis for empathy. And on this basis, mammals then became increasingly complex in terms of their, their uh, sensibilities. And of course, human beings are at the very arrowhead of the ability to feel uh, the feelings of others. And so this makes possible um, compassion that we might have for other, other living creatures and compassion we might have for, for humans. So Harry Harlow's research was really, really important because it showed us that, that love wasn't just an idea, but it actually had profound f uh, physiological consequences, it had pr profound psychological consequences, and was really at the basis of, of the development of mammals. Well, that was beautiful, um, Dr. Penn. Thank you so much. And are you, do you, what's your family situation? So I'm married uh, to a wonderful woman. Her name is Kathy, and they have two children. They were born in Bolivia. They're now 37 and 34, and uh, they have children. 
and uh, so I have. Uh, your grandfather. Grand I'm a grandfather, exactly. Oh, that's that's great. And how did you meet your wife? I met my wife at a Baha'i gathering. My wife had um, returned to the United States from Bolivia. She had actually escaped Bolivia because uh, she was in a, a relationship that had become um, uh, abusive. And so she took the children, and with the help of the U.S. Embassy, she was able to escape. And uh, when she arrived in this country, um, I had been writing articles in the newspaper at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, she um, encountered um, those articles. And uh, to my surprise, had begun to actually uh, pray for Michael Penn. Uh, and uh, she uh, prayed for Michael Penn for a year before she met me. What? And strangely enough, I started to have dreams that I was going to meet the woman that I was going to marry. And uh, every day I would um, hope that it would be today that I would meet her. And one Saturday I woke up and I had the very strong sense that it was that day that I was going to meet this woman that I had been dreaming about. So I dressed appropriately. I went out and uh, went to a friend's house. And uh, she was there. And after the meal, I was washing dishes and she came and she stood next to, she stood next to me and she said, uh, hi, my name is Kathy. And I said, hi, my name is Michael Penn. And she said, oh, my God. I've been praying for you for oh, a year. No way. And I said, to this her, is like a Hollywood movie. Absolutely. I said to her, we should go out sometime. <laughs> you and she dog. said, she <laughs> said, yes, we should go out today. And so we took the children. She had two children. And uh, we took the children to uh, the museum in Philadelphia. And as we were driving home, uh, I remembered the feeling that I had that morning. And I said, I think we're going to get married. Wow. And she said, maybe. And sure enough, uh, three months later, we were, we were married. That is such a beautiful story. I can't believe it. <laughs> yes, I was so fortunate. What a great human being Kathy is. <laughs> um, that's a beautiful story. Uh, how long ago was that? That was 31 years ago. So we'll celebrate our 32nd anniversary this summer. Oh, beautiful. In July. Congratulations. Thank that's you. Gorgeous. Um, so... You've written a lot about hope and hopelessness. Uh, you mentioned it briefly before. Um, we seem to be in a very hopeless time, at least sitting here in Los Angeles. You know, all my friends, Baha'is included, are so despairing, seem to be hopeless, very angry, uh, a lot of protest going on, a lot of reactivity. W tell me about this study of hope and hopelessness, and is there hope for the times that we're in right now? You know, one of my favorite philosophers is the great philosopher Karl Jaspers. And Karl Jaspers lived in the time of Nazi Germany. Uh, and uh, he saw so many of his colleagues uh, who were brilliant philosophers give their lives over to Nazism. And he wondered, how could this possibly be? And he started to think about uh, the development of humanity as a species. He was one of the first philosophers to write a kind of a historiography of the human species. And one of the things that he wrote about was what he called axial ages. He described the first axial age as taking place between roughly 800 and 200 um, BCE. And he said, in that period, humanity as a species acquired a new mind. It was as though we were going along with a way of thinking that had survived for thousands of years, and then suddenly there appeared in the world these extraordinary thinkers. There was Lao Tzu and Confucius in China. There was the Buddha in India. There were the prophets of Israel in Mesopotamia. There was Zoroaster in, 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 um, in Persia. And he said, it was as though our way of thinking suddenly underwent a radical transformation mm. in a period of about 300 years. And he said that all of the great civilizations of the world came out of that time. Mm. And as I was reading uh, uh, Karl Jasper's work, I was reflecting also on Baha'u'llah's teachings. And one of the things that Baha'u'llah says about the period that we're living in is that he describes this as another axial period in the life of humanity. And that, that humanity must acquire a new way of thinking. And that, that it's not simply that uh, the content of our thinking has to change, 
in other words, that we have to acquire more knowledge. It is that our very way of thinking has to change. And that in order for this to happen, we have to confront the impotence of our current way of thinking. We have to, we have to struggle through uh, modes of thinking that cripple our capacities. And so a lot of the suffering that we're seeing in the world comes from our stubborn clinging to old patterns of behavior, to old patterns of thought. And as we loose ourselves from these old patterns, we will find new energies liberated, new aspirations realized. And so we, our, our hope is not so much in having an easy passage into a peaceful future, but rather in, in the struggle to acquire uh, uh, as a species a mind that's grounded in, in, in an awareness, in a consciousness of, of, of our interdependence, our, our oneness, our essential connection to one another as human beings. And unless this is realized at every level, in the, in the level of the family, in the level of the community, in the neighborhood, in the level of the nations, in the relations among nations, in our political economy, unless we realize these things, we will not be able to find uh, peace and we will not be able to find the kind of uh, happiness and joy that is, that is possible uh, for, for human beings. So we're in a, in a very, very significant period of growth and change. And we have to make our contribution to it uh, in, whatever, in whatever way we can. And it's in making that contribution that we find hope and we find um, a renewed strength and energy uh, for, for this, uh, this tumultuous period. Wow, that is so beautifully said. Uh, thank you so much. It's, I, I think about Dr. Michael Carlberg and the culture of contest and the, the writings of the House of Justice and of Shogi Effendi about that new way of thinking where the current mode of thinking is, okay, we have to, in order to achieve peace, we have to agree on these certain criterion for peace. And once we agree on, on this, so we'll have a wall here and we'll have a trade pact like this and we'll resolve this dispute. Once we get those things, then we can have peace. But a new mode of thinking for the current day um, might be to think of ourselves as so interconnected that we must have peace. That is part of our nature to be, our spiritual nature, our higher nature, to live in peace and to agree in peace and unity and to and to kind of almost accept unity as a given first and those other things then will shake down and resolve themselves later so it's this it's an inverse i've been thinking about that a lot i, I know i'm not terribly articulate about it but is that what you're talking about no i think that's a very interesting observation um i i love michael kohlberg's work as well and uh, just to amplify one of the things that you said about his work is that he points out that many people feel that peace will follow um, economic justice. Peace will follow um, uh, the, the eradication of prejudice. But actually, uh, it seems that what we have to do is we have to pursue human solidarity. We have to pursue mm -hmm. human unity. And out of human solidarity will come economic justice because we will long for economic justice. We cannot have justice imposed upon us. We have to choose it. And this is part of the liberty of being human beings. Uh, um, we have to uh, long for um, uh, loving connection with our white and black uh, brothers and sisters. And with that longing comes a way of relating that brings it into being. Mm. Um, and, that's, uh, that's gorgeous. And, and so, I, I, yes. And that's, the, and that's the discussion. Uh, that's the discussion of the human spirit that you were talking about at the very beginning in your book. Yes, that's right. the The goal is to develop ourselves so that we become the kind of people that can inspire in others that which is noble, and also resolve conflicts that are not resolvable given our current state of development. Mm. And so we have to become the kind of people that can solve the difficult problems that we have because we are 
capable of achieving unity with people that uh, had previously been uh, thought of as, as enemies, has previously been thought of as oppressors. And so as we develop the capacity to enter into meaningful, productive relationships with all kinds of people, the world becomes a better place. Mm, that's beautiful. And uh, I've, I've noticed in your work, there's kind of a, a balancing of two traditions. You're in the you're firmly ensconced in the academic schol scholastic tradition of the West, but you uh, explore and are a student of the kind of more holistic wisdom enlightenment tradition of the East. So can you explain these two traditions further and how you find a balance between the two? Sure, sure. There's a really, really wonderful quotation that I love. Allow me to read it to you. It's from uh, Confucius. He says, the ancients who wished to illustrate illustrious virtue throughout the empire first ordered well their own states. Wishing to order well their states, they first regulated their families. Wishing to regulate their families, they first cultivated their persons. Wishing to cultivate their persons, they first rectified their hearts. Wishing to rectify their hearts, they first sought to be sincere in their thoughts. Wishing to be sincere in their thoughts, they first extended to the utmost their knowledge. Such extension of knowledge lay in the investigation of things. So Confucius saw society as built upon the expansion of knowledge. And he thought about knowledge as having two dimensions. On the one hand, there was knowledge of nature, the processes of nature, the mysteries of nature. That tradition of learning became the sciences in the West. But there was another tradition of learning that had to do with knowledge and refinement of the self, the cultivation of one's own character. And this tradition was in the wisdom enlightenment tradition of learning. And so what we're seeing is now we're seeing the meeting of the wisdom enlightenment tradition with the academic scholastic tradition. The scientist, the philosopher, the mystic, and the servant are united in one person. Mm. And, and to the extent that we can cultivate all of these capacities in ourselves, we become capable of addressing the, the, the great challenges uh, of, of, of this era, of this time. Wow. That's, that's, that's incredible. I, I love that quote so much. It's, and it so relates to the Baha'i faith of that, you know, to change the world, we have to start with our hearts. Or they, they go hand in hand. You can't have yeah. one without the other. That's if you right. want to change the world, you have to start really small and inside when you're That's with your right. own behavior. That's and, right. And um, yeah, it's fascinating. That's, great. That's right. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think also there's this idea that it's necessary for human beings to draw from mystic sources. You know, in all the great traditions, human beings are not capable of accomplishing their, their uh, highest self uh, without the aid of mystical forces. You know, in, in, in Taoism, uh, the idea is to uh, become capable of manifesting powers that transcend the self. And uh, in the Baha'i faith, uh, in Judaism, in Islam, there's this idea that when human beings are rightly motivated, when we have the right intentions, we become magnets that attract to us powers that transcend our own puny selves. And these powers enable us to accomplish things that are impossible to accomplish without the aid of God. And so this is one of the reasons why Baha'is uh, pray and meditate each day, so that we can refine our moral and spiritual susceptibilities to these energies that have a transformative influence in human relationships. And this is such a flawed way of thinking in, current, uh, in the current academic world and in, you know, in most of Western culture that that doesn't exist, that there aren't profound thinking, there isn't mis that mystical thinking doesn't really exist because we're just molecules and you know, science has all the answers and um, any kind of, you know, the very popular books these days, um, any kind of mysticism they have in it um, 
only relates to science and the miracles of the modern world. I'm thinking about like the show Cosmos. So the original Cosmos was, I was talking to Dr. Stephen Phelps about this, the original Cosmos had this incredible mysticism to it. And Carl Sagan was just filled with the wonder of the universe that uh, resonated in all these different ways. And then the new version of Cosmos was, the only mystery in it is like, isn't it incredible how complex the brain is? Isn't it incredible how complex these galaxies are? And it's, it was solely about science itself. Well, one of the things that scientists have discovered is that human beings are the most sensitive signal detection system in the known universe. And we can detect many, many different kinds of signals. And so, for example, on the surface of every cell, there are proteins. And these proteins detect signals from the inner space of the body. So, for example, these uh, proteins can detect uh, insulin in the atmosphere. It can detect glucose. And so there's an internal signal detection system, and there's also an external signal detection system. And we find that as human beings develop, their ability to perceive different kinds of signals also develops. It's one of the reasons why, for example, we can do science, right? What a scientist does is a scientist perceives signals in the operation of matter that are translatable into formulas. So we, 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 for example, detect signals that give us information about forces of gravity, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force. So what religions are, are simply saying is that our ability to detect signals in the universe are not limited to physical signals, that we also have the capacity, for example, to detect uh, things like intentions. Intentions are not physical phenomena. Intentions are psycho-spiritual phenomena. Mm. We can detect the motivations of others. We can detect when someone is performing an act uh, with a pure heart as opposed to an egotistical heart. And so our ability to detect both uh, physical and spiritual dimensions of reality. For example, even intelligence, right, is a spiritual phenomenon. It's not a physical phenomenon. There's Nobody has ever seen or touched or smelled or heard intelligence. But yet... Even in respond. Einstein's brain, you can't scan it and find out it, where the intelligence lies. Ex exactly right. And so, so the space between the spiritual uh, and the scientific is not so great as we imagine. And to bridge that, I think we need the power of philosophy. That, that, that philosophy enables us to bridge the extraordinary insights of science with the extraordinary insights and wisdoms of, of religion. And uh, without philosophy, I think it's, it's, it's really difficult for us to make this bridge. And so I think that we should all become uh, more philosophical in our orientation both to science and, and, to, and to religion. Oh, well said. I did want to cover a topic. I'm not really sure what the entry point is, but I know that you've dealt a lot with race and, and racism and the importance of healing racism, which, again, can feel really theoretical sometimes. Oh, we really should heal racism. Um, but it's very hard to do. I find myself kind of flummoxed around that, you know, as a white guy living in the upper middle class suburbs of Los Angeles. Um, how, what do I do? How can I help heal the, the issues around, around racism? Sometimes I feel hopeless around it, mm. uh, but I know, I know it's crucial. Um, mm. so what, what is your, what has your studies been around, uh, mm. around those topics? Mm. That's, that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, a few years ago I was sitting in my office and, a uh, white student came into my office to chat and he was at the time wearing his cap backwards and he was clearly from a very very wealthy family and as I was sitting with the student I noticed that I was feeling a lot of resentment towards the student mm. and uh, there was no basis for it whatsoever I was simply judging him based upon his social address and as I became aware of the fact that I was being quite hostile in my heart towards this young man who had not even said three or four words to me, I realized that 
I was actually interacting with him uh, in, a, in a racially charged, actually racist way. And at that moment, I said to myself, is this really the kind of person that I want to be in relating to this young man? And so I, I, I just consciously decided that I was going to behave myself and that I was going to listen to him and that I was going to respect him. And actually, I, lo I love the way that you used behave yourself because it's to behave differently, to, yeah. to change your intent, to change yeah. the way you were seeing the world or witnessing the world is to exactly change your right. behavior. In exactly other words, right. to behave oneself. Yeah, exactly right. And as I began to change my attitude towards him, his facial expression softened. The way he spoke to me became more and more calm, more and more relaxed. Gradually, we began to have a, a quality of interaction that I hadn't had in a long time mm. with a young man from his demographic. Mm. Mm. And so it just taught me a lot about overcoming racism has to begin in my heart, in my mind, in my mode of relating. And it doesn't matter whether you're black or white. It has to begin in, in your own inner space. So that's, that's one dimension of it. That work of, of speaking to others, thinking about others in ways that liberate them from 500 years of a tradition of disrespect, of, of prejudgment, of coarseness, Mm. Um, that's, that's, that's part that's, of it. That's interesting the, um, that you say that because one thing that I've tried to do recently and, 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 yeah. and it's a little bit in terms of race and it's a little bit in terms of class is to really acknowledge the people in my culture who are often never acknowledged. Yeah. It's uh, the, the dishwasher at the restaurant, the gardener yeah, yeah. that when you're walking down the street that's leaf blowing your neighbor's house, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. someone doing menial labor, and to yeah. recognize them, acknowledge them, ask their name, ask how they're doing, shake their hand. Uh, I've been trying to challenge myself to do that in a way like they're human beings too, but in, a, in, a, in Western Los Angeles culture, like there's a whole class of people you just ignore. You know, you just almost pretend that they're not there doing what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that goes a long ways. But then, of course, racism is an institutional phenomenon. Yes, yeah. And so we, and so we have to, to build uh, social systems, institutional systems, that are also animated by, um, by, these, by these same virtues. Just as individuals can have virtues, institutions can have virtues. And so we have to use our power to build institutions that, uh, that respect people of, of, of all races and of all backgrounds. And we can't expect it to be easy, and we can't expect it to be quick. So How is the institution that you work for in those terms? And have you battled in that way? Or is that something that you address at Franklin and Marshall? I, I teach at a wonderful institution, but, you know, for more than 250 years, um, my institution did not have any blacks on the faculty. So I'm the first African-American tenured professor in my department, although my institution is more than 250 years old. And so- In your, de um, in your department or in the whole university? Well, I, I'm, well what, I'm the third African-American tenured in my entire institution mm. and the first in, in my department. And so we have a lot to learn about bringing in people of diverse backgrounds and helping them to feel at home, helping them to feel comfortable, um, helping them to feel like this is their place as well. Mm. But we have an outstanding president, uh, one, of the, one of the finest presidents, I think, in the country. Um, and uh, so we're making, we're making progress. And uh, I think that, in fact, all over the country, we're making tremendous progress. And we're making tremendous progress in part because we are saying to one another in, in very, very open ways that uh, we want to have relationships that are, that are different from the kinds of relationships that our parents had and our grandparents had and our great-great-grandparents had with one another. Mm. And uh, you're seeing this, uh, especially in young people. I'm seeing it, uh, certainly in the young people that I'm interacting with. And uh, so I'm, I'm extremely extremely hopeful 
for the future of the country. Oh, that's and wonderful. Have you heard, um, Malcolm Gladwell did a series of podcasts and he had three of them on higher education in the United States and, and diversity was one of the issues that he touched on. I highly recommend, it's a great, it's a great listen. He's such a great thinker and he approaches problems from such interesting perspectives, but those three specifically about higher education, you can find it under his podcast. I, I, I can't recommend more highly. I will certainly go to, to listen to those. I would love to. Yeah. And on that note, that note of hope, uh, Dr. Michael Penn, thank you so much for speaking with me. I've thank learned you. so I much. I, I feel like this should be a series of discussions. Like I just want to be, I think that you should sit on top of a mountain, you know, like one of those old gurus <laughs> and people should walk up, have to walk up the mountain to speak to That would be truly you. ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You'd, you'd look good thank in a Thank you so much for your kindness towards me. And, oh, and please. I really have been loved speaking with you and I look forward to seeing you on television and hearing you uh, also on your podcast and on the radio. Oh, thanks so much for your time and your generosity and you, uh, have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much and good night.